So, well, we're very happy to have uh, Adam Nardis paying his once every five year visit to us. Yes, well, we did announce it, but I, I know I read it, and of course, you know, that. obviously, I would have forgotten it. No. I didn't have to compare okay. it. I just swapped without thinking. We do, we do. Uh, but glad everyone's here, and I think there are some people who are actually zooming in, taking advantage of our. Uh, Zoom possibility um, to appear. Adam, who comes from the University of Nebraska, um, who would talk about a song of water and fire. Now, his folks and Kurama, Kuramoto Shibasinski equations. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for the very kind invitation for you to be back. Uh, and it's been a gracious host. We've had a great time talking about. Uh, all kinds of uh, fun things with MHD equations. Um, yeah, it's just it's good to be here. Um, let me ask before we jump in, um, how are you guys in terms of like, I don't know, are you PDE people for the most part? If I talk about Berger's equation, you know what I'm talking about? Or we I... Okay, okay. Well, I can go a little faster on, on some parts. Uh, but if there's anything, uh, just, just stop me. Uh, yeah, the, well, it's uh, kind of, uh, for the talk, and so there we go. Yeah. Fire and burgers. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. Water, fire, and, and, and burgers, which that's is actually a hamburger. That's what they meant. They yeah, mean, that's a barbecue. That's actually a, a name of a restaurant that I was was thinking of opening soon. Which is much better than the previous name, which was Viscous Burgers, which was kind of gross. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so so this is. Um, with uh, a bunch of people listed on the last slide, but those are two of the students. Uh, so Matt Enloe is uh, working with me at University of Nebraska. He's, he's got some work on this. And then there's also Mohammed Rahman uh, at Texas Tech, student of uh, Kazuo Yamazaki, who's also joined on this. And uh, yeah, he's, he's on the market now. Uh, Matt's not just yet, but I think next year will be. Uh, OK, so I'm going to talk about that stuff. Um, but uh, I want to tell you about uh, Kirmaro Shibuchensky. Now that I assume. Maybe not everyone has heard of uh, KSE, yeah. So, um, and let's see. Oh, Zoom people probably can't see me write this on the board, right? I didn't well, think about that. Don't but, worry too much. All right. Not much Zoom people, I'm writing on the board. So, uh, let's put the equation down. Uh, which form did I want to write it in? So, uh, we have this kind of uh, form. So, on, on the left, We've got Berger's type equation, and maybe I will just remind briefly of what, the, what that thing will do. So if, if we take Berger's equation, um, and let me just put uh, zero on the right hand side, so, so it is Berger. Uh, if, we, if we take a look at what that looks like, so it start with initial data like this, just a little blob, run it forward, and right, we get a, a, a steep front developing, but then, well, the solution breaks down. Uh, bad things happen because what happens is this term is intensifying gradients. The UUX term is intensifying gradients. Um, if we add back some viscosity, though, uh, oh, kill that. Just to sort of remind, so we're all thinking have the same similar pictures in our mind, uh, right? So if I run forward here, so now now we're putting on the right hand side uh, some. Discussing so U U X and uh, right because the, uh, the we, we have a, 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 some curvature developing on the right hand side. Uh, this is just going to diffuse and everything uh, comes out rather nicely. So it prevents the shock from occurring. Right? If on the other hand uh, we reverse the sign on the right hand side, then we have some kind of oops, some kind of like a backward heat equation. So. In that case, so if I put uh, even without the nonlinearity, right? If I put a minus on the right hand side, then run this thing forward, right? Well, then I have slowed it down a little bit, but yeah, uh, massive instability arises. The thing is uh, pretty crazy. So, um, all right. So let's take a look at uh, going back to. There it is. Too many things open. So if we take a look at the Kirmanov-Shevchinsky equation, it's got 
uh, this nonlinear term, the UUX, has got this uh, second order derivative, but it's got the wrong sign. So lambda here is just a positive quantity. Hello, come on in. Hi. Uh, so we have uh, basically a bad term here. Right? This guy is bad. Uh, we have on the right a fourth order derivative term, but this one turns out to have the, the right sign. So this one is uh, good. So we have the good, the bad, and yeah, this one intensifying gradients, right? Um, so let's see how this thing works a little bit. Uh, th there it is. And by the way, it's, uh, you can write it. It's higher dimensional form here. So you get those uh, second derivatives and fourth derivatives just become Laplacian and bi-Laplacian. And then you get a term, a unit grad U term, which I'll mention more in a little bit. Uh, you can also write, some people like to write uh, kirchner uh equation in its, uh, its uh, say, integrated form or scalar form. So if you start with um, the bottom equation uh, and take the gradient of it, then you get the, this uh, vector equation, this, this uh, top equation there. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the vector equation because it's got that never, never stokes down linearity, which uh, we really like. So, uh, what do simulations of Kirman and look like? It's kind of like this. So, as opposed to burgers, which just kind of uh, you know goes to uh, either either blows up or goes to a nice uh, steady state. Kirman and is nice and chaotic, just even in 1D, right? So this this equation uh, goes all over the place, and uh, we'll see why in, in just a minute. Thinking about these different terms, so uh, a lot of people say that this is like a model for. Um, flame fronts and things like that. So you can kind of think about maybe the blue region is, is uh, burnt. Say you take a piece of paper, light it on fire. I, I've always wanted to do this on a, on a demo, but I don't, I don't think it would <laughs> have to have an outdoor thing or maybe I can film it or something. Like a real live but, demo or on the computer? Yeah, 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 yeah just, uh, right. Have a oh, little yeah. fire technique. In, in the restaurant, the burger's restaurant. That's right, in the, in the burger's restaurant. Uh, so uh, we have like a burned and unburned region. There's actually uh, sort of a zeroth order um, approximation between those two. Uh, but uh, yeah, and you sort of are following, you can you kind of picture it as I'm, I'm following the say average uh, of that point as, as the uh, one region is sort of burned and you know, like, a, like a camera sort of moving along between the burned and unburned regions. Uh, so some people say it's a model for that. Uh, some people have used it as a model for uh, flow down inclined planes, crystal growth, all kinds of things like that. Charlie Doring always said it was a model for this. So who knows? Uh, let's see why it works and sort of take it apart a little. Uh, if we just look at the right hand side, so those are the, the linear terms there, uh, and we take a Fourier transform, then we know that one derivative uh, in, in Fourier space turns into IK, two derivatives. Uh, I squared K squared, so we get a, uh, a minus, but this minus cancels with the, the other minus and gives us a plus. And then we get a, a K4 over here because I to the fourth is one. Uh, and so this thing is going to be unstable, at least uh, in terms of the linear term, when that right hand side is positive. And with a little algebra, we say that that right hand side positive, right, that right hand side is going to be positive exactly on the low modes when K is small. So this is kind of a little different than we think about for uh, never Stokes, right? Never Stokes, the, the problem is often with, with high modes. Here, it's with low modes. So uh, this, and this model is actually uh, unstable, but I believe it was Idris Titi in the 90s who observed uh, this kind of mechanism for, for everything holding together. That is the good, the bad, and the ugly terms work together uh, by, in, in the following way. The, uh, energy at low modes is sort of generated by this uh, this backward diffusion term. So you have sort of a, an upwelling of energy there. If you just linearize the equation, it will blow up. Uh, the, it'll, it'll be, say, the, the low modes will grow exponentially fast and, and the high modes will decay, but you know there's uh, sort of nothing uh, preventing those low modes from growing exponentially fast. Um, on the other hand, we have the nonlinear term. The nonlinear term is going to take energy from large scales and shift it into small scales. Intense as, as it as that sort of wave starts to crest, that's creating all these small scales, and those small scales now get consumed by the uh, fourth order diffusion term. So that's the idea: is that uh, the nonlinearity is is uh, stabilizing force in this, which is part of what makes this equation just uh, fascinating. So. 
Okay, how about in 2D? So uh, this is a simulation uh, in 2D. You see on the right-hand side, it's the energy spectrum. Um, and it just sort of uh, reaches a nice stable point. The left-hand side, uh, the, the uh, picture in physical space there um, is, is a sort of, you know, just uh, chaotic looking situation, like, you know, kind of, kind of similar to what we saw in the 1D case. Uh, but the 2D case has a lot more uh, mystery behind it than the 1D case, as we'll see. So um, I can't list every paper on 1D KSE because it's, uh, it's, it's very, very long. So just a couple of highlights. Um, so, so Kirimoto, Kirimoto uh, Suzuki and Shubashinsky came up with this equation back in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, Shubashinsky was working on flame fronts and Kirimoto uh, and Suzuki were working on perturbations of certain equations arising in quantum mechanics. Uh, but uh, it, it kind of really took off analytically in the 80s with people starting to understand this thing sort of from a dynamical systems point of view. Um, so pretty early on, there's a great paper by, uh, by Nikolai Kosher and Tamam, where they realized that this, they, they were able to show that this thing has a, a global attractor um, by a, kind of a non trivial arg argument. If you think about taking uh, your, your sort of standard proof for global attractor for say, 2D never stokes, uh, what do you do? You, you want some time independent bounds on some norm. So you go usually after the L2 norm, take an inner product of the equation, some term, the nonlinear term will drop, and you're able to get some kind of uh, control over the system thanks to the dissipation. Um, here, it's uh, much more difficult. If I take an inner product with you, the left-hand side behaves rather like in never Stokes. Uh, the right-hand side, the good term, I can integrate my parts twice and get nice control in the H2 norm, specifically L2 in time, H2 in space. But the bad term on the right, when you once you take an inner product, will be something like uxx uh, inner product with u. And now uh, I have to do something, right? We have to, uh, for for example, uh, for instance, um, bound this term above. But then all of a sudden, uh, so so you can integrate by parts, but you have the wrong sign, right? Uh, or you can you know break this up with. Um, uh, Say, uh, say Young's inequality um, and, and uh, absorb part of the, the second order term into the, uh, the, the, the H2 semi norm, but you're left with some growth, you're left with exponential growth. So it's, it's non trivial how to get, uh, uh, say, time independent bounds. Um, and they were able to do it by this very clever use of a gauge function that was later kind of uh, generalized by Goodman and Colette and, and others. Uh, in the early 90s to, so, so Nicola and Gosher and Tamam were able to do it for uh, odd uh, solutions and, and uh, these other guys were able to extend it to uh, general solutions. So this is, again, this is all in 1D. And then there's so much that's gone on since then. Um, all kinds of things looking at uh, dimension of the tractor, looking at, different, it's, it's one of those equations where uh, it, everything you wish you could do for more complicated equations, you can do for Kirimoto Shibashinsky, usually, not always, but for 1D Kirimoto Shibashinsky, um, there, there's just an awful lot that, that uh, can be shown about this equation, the existence of inertial manifold, things like that. Uh, all right, so uh, how about 2D, right? Well, I said that the other one was a, a pretty incomplete list. This uh, slide, on, uh, th this portion on 2D is actually a fairly complete list of what's uh, been written for 2D KSE. I'm sure there's a couple of papers here and there that uh, I might've been unaware of or, or, or didn't put for one reason or another, um, but this is more or less it. Uh, so it's so a small collection of papers uh, dating back uh, to early work of George Sell and, and Tabota in 92, and then a couple of works in recent years. Um, so short time existence was approved in, in uh, Jeff Ray's face by Pizwaz and Swanson. Uh, and that was actually an n-dimensional result, so no, no worries about, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's 2D that's sort of the problem. Um, and then recently there's been some, some great work by Ana Mazzucato and David Ambrose and uh, Fang and uh, some others who kind of push this forward. Of course, uh, Igor has done uh, a lot of really nice work in, um, in thin domains or with, uh, with small data, these kinds of things. Uh, so basically, if your domain is, is thin enough, then you're sort of quasi close to 1D. And so you can prove some nice results there. 
Um, but that, that's about it. And so why, right? Uh, what are we, right? We're missing all of these things, global existence for, for uh, general data, um, and of course, anything involving an attractor in that, because we don't even have global existence. What about uh, determining modes or nodes? I mean, we're, we're just completely stuck in, in two dimensions. This is not the case for an average dose. So let's, let's try to understand why. So to understand why, let's go back to 1D and see what we understand in 1D. Uh, so I uh, wrote the equation like this. By the way, lambda I just take to be a, uh, it's just a, a parameter. You can kind of think about it like a Reynolds number. So some people like to put, uh, 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 so it's dimensionless parameter. This is dimensionless form. You can put you can put it in front of the you can put a dimensionless quantity in front of the fourth order term. But I like it here because the larger the lambda is, then the worse the the solution is. Right, the more unstable modes you have. So um, what happens? So I was kind of uh, mentioning this earlier with energy estimates. It, so so here double bars means L two norm. If I take it in a product with you, uh, we get something like this. Uh, on the right hand side, we bound above. Um, with Coach Schwartz and Young's inequality. And what about the nonlinear term? Well, no problem, right? Because I've got UUX in a product with U, integrating just, just take a periodic domain if you like, although you can take physical boundary conditions as well. Uh, this uh, UUX times U, well, that's secretly one third U cubed X derivative. This is a total derivative when you integrate it, it's zero. So we have no, no trouble at all. Uh, okay, let's try the same thing in higher dimensions. Uh, and I'll go with the vector form, but similar things hold for the, the scalar form. Uh, all right, take it in a product with you. Okay, we, have, we seem to have no problem here. Uh, our, our by Laplacian turns into L2 normal Laplacian on the left-hand side. Uh, on the right-hand side, the, the, the bad term, seemingly bad term, at least in terms of global well posedness, is actually not all that bad. Again, we can do exactly the same trick. Uh, but now what happens? Uh, life gets a little more interesting. Because that nonlinear term, u dot grad u in a product with u is no longer zero. So, um, right, and what do we have, right? This is essentially some type of uh, cubic uh, guy on the right hand side. So, uh, and remember, if you have just an ODE, y prime is equal to y to some power higher than one, then your estimate, right, then this, this equation blows up. So, in particular, you're sort of uh, algebraically killed in this situation. Uh, the, this cubic is bounds on this cubic no matter what you do. And a lot of times when I talk to people about Kirin Motor Shevchinsky, they say, oh, well, can you, you know, put on some more diffusion? Can you uh, do, you know, put on, say, uh, some, some type of uh, filter on the nonlinear term, these kinds of things. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Um, but the answer is no, none of that works. None of that works because you, you are not, your enemy is not the, the small scales. Your enemy is the large scales. Uh, your enemy is this cubic term that you don't know how to control and it just, you just get stuck. That's it, right? So wait a minute. We know for Never Stokes that, uh, you know, we have no trouble uh, in, in uh, at least in two dimensions. Um, we know for n-dimensional burgers, we actually have no trouble. Uh, and so why? Because the, those, uh, we have a similar kind of nonlinear term uh, in those. So uh, oh, as I'm talking about that, apparently I put that slide at this stage. Okay, I feel like I want to come back to that, but maybe I'll talk about it now. Uh, all right, so with uh, Raman uh, pictured at the, the beginning and Kazuo Yamazaki, uh, recently we did some sort of uh, proteoserin type estimates for this, uh, for this system. So if you have you uh, in some nice enough space, uh, some integrability class, then you get global well posedness for the Kirimoto Shibushinsky, even in dimensional. By the way, I should mention two dimensions is actually sort of the right natural space for Kirimoto Shibushinsky because you can kind of think about it as like a, an evolving surface between, for, for example, a burned and unburned region. So it's sort of two dimensions is sort of the right physical space. Uh, similar things happen. So all over the place, if you have control over uh, you, if you have control over just one component of, of the velocity, if you have control over the gradient of the velocity, if you have control of the, the divergence of the velocity, which I think is actually really the key to solving something about this equation. Um, if you have control over, say, just one component of, of the, uh, the gradient, um, in all of these cases, uh, even some of the things about the, the scalar equation, um, if you have a nice enough integrability class, 
you control everything. So sort of conversely, if 2D Kiramoto Shevchinsky blows up, uh, then uh, all of these quantities have to blow up simultaneously. Uh, okay, I guess the list goes on there. So we have even more. Um, we then wanted to test this uh, for um, uh, you know, computation, see what happens. And so we, we did some simulations and what we we're hoping to see is some kind of nice curves that grow slowly and we could say something about uh, if they're integrable or not integrable. Uh, but it turns out you get this kind of situation. So here, uh, so the x-axis is time and then the y-axis is some LP norm. And it's a little hard to see in the, in the legend there, but the bottom one is a L1 norm uh, and the top one is L infinity norm and we have some LP norms just sort of in between there. And what do you see? You see, if you, can, if you look closely, uh, it grows very, very rapidly. All of these norms grow very rapidly. And then they just sort of stabilize and just sort of bounce around forever. We don't, uh, we, we don't get any sort of, I mean, it looks more or less like they probably are bounded, but maybe there's some uh, spikes in here that we're not seeing, or maybe if you simulate out to large enough times, uh, things are looking okay. So we uh, started to think that this, this thing is uh, maybe globally well posed. Um, but the jury's still out there. Uh, okay, and then we did similar things for, these are uh, LP norms of various uh, derivatives, things like that, things that were mentioned on the, on the theorems in the previous slide. Uh, for any of you who like energy entropy plane stuff, so we put the L2 axis, or sorry, the, the L2 norm on the x-axis, the uh, H1 semi-norm on the y-axis, you just sort of see what happens. So it sort of looks like you're going to some sort of attracting state uh, over in the, um, energy has to be plain. So, so the solution sort of evolves up to that region and bounces around. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, uh, seeing a little bit more about these energy estimates. So what would work for control? Uh, if we, we we go through kind of the same procedure, now we'll, we'll talk about it in scalar form, but uh, same procedure with energy estimates. And uh, look what happens. So on the left-hand side, we get uh, some kind of control. Now we don't have any control over the, the denominator term. We don't know what's going on with the sign of this term. However, if that left-hand side happened to be uh, negative, the, excuse me, happened to be positive, no problem. We could just, we'd be done. We could just throw the, the term away and get a, a nice bound. In, in this equation, bounding the L2 norm is, is enough. Uh, similar things happen for the uh, vectorial form. And so you can actually look at those uh, at, this, uh, at those terms in red that I had on, on the left uh, side of the screen, and they don't necessarily look positive everywhere, but they look maybe positive in some type of time average. Uh, so this is the one with the, uh, the scalar nonlinearity, the vector nonlinearity, the scalar nonlinearity plus the uh, L two norm from the term with the good sign, uh, and then this is in the vector case the uh, nonlinearity with the L2 norm plus a good side. And this one actually does seem to look positive for, for an awful long time. So maybe there's something there. Maybe there's some way to, I, I, so I always show these slides uh, in hopes that, you know, somebody will get an inspiration and say, oh yeah, maybe, you know, a time integral or something will work. Yeah. Before I, so these graphs, are they for the solution or for just Random functions. No, no, no. they're for the solution. So you compute the solution and then you compute the, those terms. And yeah, yeah, yeah. These are what? What kind of initial data you are taking? Uh, in this case, we take initial data by uh, three Greek authors whose name, whose initials are K, K, P. Um, I can send you the reference if you like. I, I always have trouble pronouncing their names. Um, and it's just a sign of uh, x plus y. Although we, you know, in the vector form, we just take the uh, the greater of that. I think, sorry, it's sine of x plus y plus sine of x plus sine of y, I think, something like that. So it's very simple initial data, and we just evolved from there. But we, we've messed around with other initial data. We see similar kind of results. Um, but that's, that's the one that we use to generate this. Uh, in fact, uh, there is, is uh, here, here's the solutions. And what I'm showing here are, uh, right, all those quantities on the left were integrated in space. This is if you don't integrate in space. Uh, these are the integrands from that previous thing. And if, if anything's a vector, for instance, uh, no, actually none of those are, are vectorial, so it's, it's okay. Uh, but what you see is sort of um, those uh, regions. Of, so, so for instance, in this case, you're interested if, if this term uh, is maybe not positive, but positive on average. 
Uh, and what you see is those uh, strong negative regions are sort of concentrated in these uh, ring-like structures uh, around, uh, you know, kind of in these, in these kind of little cells that evolve. You saw earlier how these things sort of fluctuate very quickly back and forth. But um, if one could rigorously prove that these, uh, you know, black regions are really dominated by the, the, if the negative regions are dominated by the positive regions, um, one could show global opposedness. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have a lot to claim with these last few slides. Uh, I mean, we, we were basically trying to understand uh, deeper about the, the, the theorems that we had uh, on the product theorem, but yeah, question. Uh, you, you just mentioned some initial conditions, right? The yeah. Of Any reason you specifically take that? Uh, yeah, because uh, there's a paper that did an extensive study using that initial data, and then we can just say, so well, they just, used like, it. Benchmark your, yeah. your simulation. Yeah, but, but if you use whatever initial, you just choose random initial, just uh, even completely static random initial data, uh, so this is not even smooth, um, you get similar pictures. Basically, what happens is that the uh, the, the fourth order term regularizes everything so fast that you're more or less, it, it's, it's a roughly equivalent to start with uh, smooth initial data and then smooth initial data, wherever, however you start is very, very chaotic. And so you kind of go to states that look like this anyway. So I'd be happy to, if, if you like, we can even throw in some of those, uh, those demonstrations. I was doing, we can throw in some of those maybe after the talk if you're curious. And you get very, you know, you if if I showed you side by side two simulations uh, for late time, I think it'd be you'd be very hard pressed to say which one came from which kind of initial data, and you get to pick, you get to pick two initial data, whatever you want, uh, and start simulations. And I show you at a later time, and it's it's hard to distinguish between them. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, maybe right, and maybe, maybe there's something there that. Uh, large enough initial data or something, maybe there, there could be an issue, but, but even the size of these things seems to be almost entirely controlled by Lambda. Although, of course, we don't have a theorem for that. Uh, here's a, a few more. Um, I did, you know, just uh, some of these things in, um, you know, extra rims, wider rims, but plus, and everything seems somewhat bounded. I mean, some of these do grow pretty large. It's 10 to the 4 there, uh, but yeah, so question. Just a comment. Don't these look a lot like the convection cells that you get in heat convection uh, equations? Like yeah. The, the value and the convection instabilities. Yeah, but they're they're different, different because you're not you're not getting uh, anything kind of swirling around here. You're getting sort of uh, pulses coming up and then settling back down and moving around. So it's yeah. I agree that there's there's some kind of similar structures there, but I have no idea if there's a there's a relation. There is a, a pretty nice paper um, I think by Mispa uh, cited earlier that um, where it shows that uh, KSE is actually kind of a general equation that comes out of certain types of perturbations. So it actually arises, even though we're saying, you know, we're talking about flame fronts and things like that, it actually arises sort of all over the place. Uh, so, so there may be some connection there with Riley Bernard. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good question. Part, part of why I like to, to talk about this stuff is, is because of just getting some, you know, those kinds of questions and, and thinking about, you know, maybe trying to spur some ideas about uh, uh, other, other connections with, um, with KSE. There's so much we don't know about the equation. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I thought I was going to put this slide a little bit earlier when I put the title there, but uh, what about uh, connections with, with Nevery Stokes? Right, so this call, song was called something about a uh, song of fire and water. Um, and, and right, of course, these uh, two equations are linked by uh, this U dot gradient U term, which is part of you know, the interest for, for people who like Nevery Stokes, why we also like talking about Kirimoto Shevchinsky. Uh, just in case you uh, <laughs> Are unfamiliar with Never Stokes, or in case um, uh, just to set notation, I'll take the Never Stokes equation in this form. So, compressible, excuse me, incompressible Never Stokes, um, or have an invection term that's a U dot gradient U term, uh, a pressure gradient, and a, and a viscous diffusion term there. Uh, we also assume that, importantly, we assume that the divergence of U is equal to zero. Uh, so, um, and then these just come from Newton's second law and the continuity of mass. Uh, all right, so 
just to remind you, with the nonlinear term in every Stokes, if you looked at u dot gradient v uh, in a product with some w, then you actually have an anti-symmetry in, in the last two terms. Uh, so you can swap those two and get a minus. Well, uh, why can you do that? It turns out that's just uh, comes from integration by parts and use of that divergence free condition. But it implies that u dot gradient u in a product with u is zero, which is uh, the thing vanishes. Uh, so at least for L2 norms for Navier Stokes, we have no problem. And this is why we can get things like weak solutions and all kinds of great stuff for uh, for Navier Stokes. Uh, but let's take a look at uh, uh, right. So so at least at least in this case, we yeah, things things work out. Notice for Kirmoda Shevchinsky, uh, u dot gradient u in a product with u, as, as pointed out before, does not vanish. Uh, it's because we don't have that divergence free term. But how about n-dimensional burgers? So n-dimensional burgers, uh, you have u dot gradient u, at least you can, it's natural to take n-dimensional burgers in this form. Uh, but this thing is not divergence free. In fact, that's the main distinction between burgers and Navier Stokes. Uh, you don't have a divergence free condition, and therefore you don't have a pressure, because if I lose one equation, I need to lose one variable. Um, so uh, actually, it turns out uh, Lidgers and Sky was able to uh, prove global opposedness for uh, this, this system. Um, well, actually, there's a, a little bit of debate about exactly what was proved and, and, and that kind of thing, which I'll be happy to talk about later. But uh, what she or supposedly observed was, was the following thing, that you have uh, an equality for the speed squared of the, of the equation. So if you just take a Euclidean dot product with this equation, um, and if everything's sufficiently smooth, uh, at least for a short time, then you get something like this. And what happens? So uh, if I'm at a point of spatial maximum of the speed, then, uh, well, we know from calc one that the gradient is gonna be zero. The, derivative, the first derivative is gonna be zero. Uh, second derivative, or in this case, Laplacian, is gonna give me something negative at a point of spatial maximum. And then this term I don't have control over, except for that I already do have control over because it's you know, an absolute value of a science uh, control. So this means that at a point of spatial maximum, th this term is gone and the terms on the right are negative. And so you're decreasing at a point of spatial maximum and therefore you have a maximum principle. The maximum cannot uh, grow. Uh, so, um, Idris and I uh, commented on this in a paper in 2016, which for some reason I didn't put more reference there, that um, if, if, you, if you consider the same kind of thing, uh, but with hyper viscous burgers, um, so I, now I take burgers and I put more viscosity. Well, what should happen? Bur burgers is already a nice system. Right? It's already, ladies and guy already proves the blue opposed, everything's smooth. Now I put even more diffusion, right? I put hyper diffusion on the right-hand side, right? Well, what's going to happen? Right? Okay, well, u dot gradient u is not zero. Okay, but we already know that for burgers, that's not a problem. Uh, what do you think should happen? Is the equation better? Should be better, right? You just took a beautiful equation and put even more diffusion, right? But there's no maximum principle. Why? Because we, in Calc 1, we have a second order derivative test. We don't have a fourth order derivative test, right? This fourth order derivative, I have no control over the sign. I have no idea what it's going to do. And so actually, what we'll oppose this for, for this problem is open uh, for, for general initial beta. Uh, and this is just 2D Kiramoto Shevchinsky with uh, lambda equals zero. So it turns out that that bad term is not even the worst term. It's the nonlinear term that's a problem, right? I mean, the bad term maybe makes the thing more interesting, maybe prevents uh, existence of, uh, of a tractor if KSE even is global well posed. But it's not, that's not the issue. It's, it's these two things combined, that u dot gradient u is not zero, and you have no maximum principle, and therefore you don't know how to close your energy estimates, and the problem is open, which is bananas. It's crazy, right? This is, uh, what, what's going on? Um, OK, so let's see. Did I want to mention about this? Uh, yeah, I kind of do. Uh, I don't want to mention too much about the, so, so what happens? Uh, for Navier Stokes 2D, right? Uh, there's you in 2D, you get a hidden maximum principle, and that allows you to control uh, even the higher order derivatives. Um, 3D, we have vorticity stretching, and so it, that doesn't work. Uh, but okay, so what do you do for, for Navier Stokes? 
Uh, well, for years we've known since I guess 1932 with the work of Luray that we don't know how to uh, prove global well poisonous for uh, strong solutions that never soaks. So uh, we, we don't know how to control the system. And so we've had for what, 80 years or something now, uh, an industry of, of thinking about you know, new, uh, different ways of controlling Navier Stokes. And, and I feel like this really got started in 1963 with the work of Smogorinsky, uh, where he said, hey, uh, let's try to get something well posed, take a viscosity, or take, take your viscosity and let your viscosity depend on the, uh, the, the, the he used the symmetric gradient, but basically the gradient in regions where the gradient is large, put more viscosity there. Right now, the Smogorinsky model smooths things out a little too much, more than uh, people would like. Uh, so, you know, other things have been uh, tried. So, uh, people put higher order diffusion, like uh, Leon's did this uh, back uh, many years ago. Uh, Lynch and Skaya put uh, uh, kind of generalized the Smogorinsky model, putting sort of higher powers of uh, the symmetric gradient in the, in the viscosity. You can do other things. You can add like a high power uh, nonlinear damping. You can add dispersive effects, uh, or you can consider things uh, like uh, fast rotation. Um, you can a pretty popular one, approach in the nonlinear, sorry, in the uh, engineering community is to somehow weaken the nonlinearity. So you do this by all, uh, in any number of tricks. You can uh, smooth out the the the, the ejecting velocity. Uh, you can uh, basically, basically you, you can you can smooth out the, the, the entire uh, nonlinearity itself. There's all kinds of things you can do to kind of prevent those those uh, derivatives from grow growing. Notice all of these, all of these approaches for Navier Stokes are to uh, basically decrease uh, or prevent the growth of large gradients in Navier Stokes. But all of these fail for Pyramid or Chubashinsky. Right, and it's because you don't know how to control uh, the small scales. Uh, sorry, the large scales. Uh, the, the problem is almost exactly reversed. Uh, in in Kiramoto Shivashinsky, you're trying to control large scales, and Never Stokes, you're trying to control small scales. So these schemes have been working for years. At, la at my last count, there's something like 600 different models for uh, Never Stokes. Uh, you know, different different things that people have tried. Uh, a lot of them coming from engineering community, and, and just none of that's going to work for pure motor Shushinsky. So I feel like, oh yeah, there we go. So there's a 600 number. Uh, so I feel like uh, I, I just, for no particular reason, feel like I can grant myself and anybody else who wants to to mess around with pure motor Shushinsky license to mess around, right? So we have all these different models for for Never Stokes. Why not try to do something with with Casey? Uh, right. Uh, oh yeah, I guess. It would have been great if I had this slide up there when I was talking about that other stuff, right? Everything is backwards for QD KSE, right? For so here's a here's an every Stokes simulation where fine scales are an issue. Of course, this is 2D, so you don't actually have an issue, but uh, right, fine scales are the issue in every Stokes, large scales are the issue in, in Kirmanish Shinsky. So new strategies are needed. Uh, what can we do? So in the spirit of messing around, uh, a few years ago, Kazuo Yamazaki and I were uh, talking and uh, just, you know, we both like thinking about Hiromoto Shivashinsky. And uh, so came up with the following thing to try. Uh, I wrote, a, uh, so write out the Hiromoto Shivashinsky equation in 2D in component form on the first line there. And uh, for no good reason, we'll replace the first guy, uh, the, the, say the linear term on the, on the right-hand side, uh, instead of having this, um, this backward diffusion we'll, and, and uh, forward hybrid diffusion, we'll just have an ordinary Laplacian. So in some sense, we've, we've got less viscosity uh, here. Um, and by the way, you can even take a, a negative U1 there if you want uh, still some flavor of, of sort of a backwardness and everything works fine. Uh, so we took a look at this uh, and what happens? So it might seem that not much is gonna work because you still, uh, you still have no maximum principle uh, for the because you have a fourth order equation. But actually, writing out this the, the nonlinearity component form as well shows you the following thing: U one has a maximum principle. Why? Ladies and guy already taught us how to do this, right? Here on the left hand side, I've got derivatives of U one, and then I've got a Laplacian on U one, and so I get a maximum principle for U one, not for the whole solution, but for U one. 
right? Uh, and so that allows us to control. Uh, we've, well, we've got four pieces to control of the nonlinearity, right? We know the nonlinearity is the enemy. So u1 dx u2 uh, showing up uh, right here. So this piece uh, can be controlled because basically you've got, uh, if when, after taking in a product with u2, you've only got, you, you don't have the, the cubic to worry about anymore because u1, you can bound by an L infinity norm, right? I mean, this is, Heuristic, of course, one has to go into proof and do all that kind of stuff, but this is the, this is the intuition. What about uh, the other piece, u2, dy, u2? So this, this piece over here, uh, right? The, the first two are, are fine because we have uh, uh, that maximum principle on, on u1. But what about this other piece, right? Now I don't have a maximum principle, right, for the u2. And I'm going to take an inner product with u2. So I'm going to have a cubic. But we don't care because we already know that when the two pieces match, u2, 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 dy, u2, inner product with u2, I can write that again. That should be a cube there, sorry. I can write that again as uh, a total derivative of u2 cubed uh, with one third there, which is zero. We already know that from before. So uh, in that case, we're able to get global well poisonous. Uh, sorry, I don't know why it says 20. I, I got updated. It said 2019 before. It's all one paper. 20. Uh, 20, 20 physical D, uh, but we we're able to, to show for that model uh, that uh, if you start with initial data, at least in H1, you can prove uh, that the solution is uh, is below opposed. And the proof is pretty standard, Galerican estimates and uh, passing to uh, weak limits and things like that. Uh, however, what does it look like? So uh, we have Kirmoj Zivrzinski in the left hand column evolving in time. So uh, they all start with the same initial data. This is that initial data you were asking about. Um, and uh, it's step forward in time going down the rows. Uh, so so we, we called it, we didn't have a name for this thing. So we just called it reduced Kiromoto Shivashinsky. And notice it's got another parameter in it, the, the viscous parameter. So we tried a few different values. It's not obvious which one to pick. And I mean, maybe qualitatively they look kind of similar, uh, but I, Feel like they're they're pretty different, and we don't really expect uh, one to. So sometimes they get asked, you know, well, well, does one convert to the other? No, there's no parameter there to tune or or to allow one thing to convert to the other. So this is sort of phenomenological. Uh, you have something which is Kiromoto-Shivashinsky like. It's fourth order. It's got the same nonlinearity, but uh, it's, it's not trying to say reproduce the dynamics of of KSC. All right. So uh, later, as with Mr. Uh, Madeno, uh, we said, can we come up with some kind of idea or some kind of something like uh, never Stokes, where you have something global well post, like a lot of these kind of filtered versions of Never Stokes, where I have a knob that I can turn, I have some parameter that I can tune and get down to uh, something which is like Never Stokes, or in this case, can I have a globally well post? model such that uh, when I tune a parameter, in this case we call it epsilon, I get down to, uh, I, I converge to a solution to uh, Kiromoto Shibashinsky in 2D. Um, and of course, we mean when we talk about convergence, we know KSE has short time existence. So I mean only convergence on, you know, before any potential blow up time, right? Uh, and so we, we thought about this a bit. And by the way, this is also this is joint with uh, Zhe Hang Wu. Uh, the idea was that uh, all of those models, as we pointed out before, all of those models for Never Stokes just won't work for, for KSE because they're aimed at controlling gradients. So the idea here is to limit something about the nonlinearity, but not smooth anything out, limit the cubic nature of the nonlinearity, right? And so you can do that just by kind of artificially throwing in some type of, uh, of function, which is, so, so we took the advective velocity, but there are other choices you could pick, uh, that just limits how large the L infinity norm can grow, right? Just, just put something bounded there, uh, which is sufficiently smooth and you're okay. And we came up with a few different choices. Uh, so we call them eta one, eta two, eta three. Uh, th there's nothing canonical or particularly special about these choices, other than that they're just nice bounded uh, functions that approximate uh, the identity fairly well and, and approximate it better and better point wise as epsilon goes to zero. Um, so you can show all these, you send epsilon to zero, point wise you go to uh, the identity. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's what we have there. Uh, uh, the L infinity norm for these is is bounded by bounded by something which blows up as as epsilon uh, goes to zero. Uh, they'll have uh, uh, you know a slope at most uh, one, so Lipschitz uh, Lipschitz constant one, which seems to be important, although there may be a way around that. Uh, but yeah, here's the main idea, right? For that nonlinear term, your u dot gradient u is now going to have an eta u dot gradient u in a product of u. And when you bound above, then this L infinity norm is under control. You just beat the cubic nonlinearity and everything's okay. Uh, right? So that we have now have a quadratic bound, bound no longer cubic. Uh, and so th this is a, a preprint, but I think it should probably be out uh, pretty soon. Um, we're just kind of finishing off the last. Uh, not all the proofs are there, but we're just finishing off the last bits. Um, so we're able to prove that for that uh, solution, uh, for, for that equation, um, we start off with uh, initial data in L2, you get uh, a solution which exists globally in time. Um, and again, you know, the proof is more or less Galerkin methods, although there are a couple of funny things. So uh, uh, Matt was uh, working on this for a little bit. He said, well, I have to prove a little bit more. I said, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about? This is just uh, standard kind of Galerkin methods uh, because you know, normally on the right-hand side, you have uh, a, a quadratic nonlinearity and you can just use, um, uh, you know, um, uh, slipping my mind in the middle of a talk, uh, standard existence uniqueness uh, theorem, picard lindelof theorem to, to get... Uh, Global existence of the Galerkin system, but the right hand side now contains um, this, this function, which is uh, makes it no longer quadratic, but it's fine it's, uh, because of its Lipschitz, everything's okay. Uh, higher order regularity for this. Uh, so I've been asked about this a couple of times, so I put it in, in the slide, but um, it turns out to be a little bit more involved. It seems like it should go, but you get some trouble with the, uh, the you say, um, that. that Smoothing eta term um, into to, uh, the, the chain rule just gets a little bit messy there. Uh, but we're able to uh, show that if you take a time interval before the blow up time, you, you do get convergence. Convergence is either either or either order epsilon. Uh, if uh, in, in a case of the first nonlinearity we tried there, and epsilon squared for the other two. Uh, right. Um, yeah. So, so actually, the, the proofs are a little bit funny in that we really did have to kind of exploit the structure. So, so we actually have uh, a separate proof for each of those uh, those twists. And we call it the calming function, this eta function, because it's not a regularization. It doesn't smooth anything out. It just prevents growth. So we had to call it something, so we call it this calming function. Uh, what does it look like? So uh, we start, again, same kind of picture. Um, and this is this one was made by Matt. So I think this is just the arctan one. But we have similar things for the other, uh, similar kind of plots for the other thing. So we start here uh, with some kind of initial data. It shows a little bit of a different initial data for this one. Uh, but as you run forward in time, uh, so on the very right, I should probably rearrange this, but uh, because the other one had Kirmer Shivshinsky on the left, but here Kirmer Shivshinsky is on the right. Uh, and here we're just picking smaller and smaller epsilon. And now we do get something which kind of, as epsilon is going to zero, we do get something which is going toward uh, something that looks an awful lot more like Kermode Shivashinsky. So we, we now have this kind of tunable parameter to converge to something uh, Kermode Shivashinsky like. I, I, I have a yeah. question. Sure. I was doing calculations in my head. And then for the Galerkin approximation to prove the existence. Don't you need the nonlinearity to be some kind of there's some smoothness because you have the mm -hmm. absolute value of x inside the definition of eta j. Oh and yeah, but that's actually in the u there, then you lose differentiability. Yeah, well, th that one's actually uh, so so you lose differentiability. Yeah, that one's actually trickier. But you you lose differentiability. Well, actually, huh. well, derivative is okay. The second derivative uh, has has trouble, but the derivative is still bound. So the derivative is not continuous, but it is bounded. So it turns out yeah. that that's enough. In fact, a higher, higher, you can take. But if you plug in a u, you don't. You have to control it everywhere where the u vanishes. And how do you control those points? Uh, so let's see. So in that case, uh, it, I mean, it, again, it, it turns out to be okay because you have 
the uh, as as u goes to zero, um, you have so so on one side the so, so the derivative is, is is not continuous at zero, but you have uh, a bound on the derivative uh, from either side. So it, the, the the formula is scary, basically. That's what I yeah yeah yeah. It, it, it's it's a uh, it's it's the hardest one in the in the paper, so we had to crank on that one for a while. I don't yeah. have a problem with the third one with the arctan. Yeah, the third one yeah. is completely fine. Yeah, that one is fine. But the second the second one I don't have a problem with it. The first one is the one that. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the, the first one, um, yeah, it, it exactly because of that reason, uh, we had to exploit some of the features of the of the structure there. It's it's uh, it's non. But it works. Yeah, I mean that we were trying to get something which where I mean that we were actually stuck on that one for quite a while because we were trying to get uh, a you know a result just for kind of a general data to say oh here's the properties of, of this calling function and uh, you know we have some much it's continuity and a, a couple uh, you know features of of that new pointwise convergence and we just couldn't get it to go and then it was actually Jaihan who realized. We, we actually need to approach all three of these in a very different way. So the Arctan one is a couple of lines, simple. Right, yeah. uh, the, the others are- The natural one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the others are, uh, well, the, in particular, the first one is, is much less trivial. Yeah. So, um, okay. But yeah, so so this this is again for the, the Arctan one. Uh, and we also get, uh, not as right. I mean, just to point that and point out something about that, uh, right? In that case, with the with the first one, we only get converged up to uh, epsilon. So we, we lose something. It's not it's not as uh, that was not as nice. Um, we get uh, so we take a look at uh, L two norms of the difference. Actually, this is uh, the L infinity in time L two norm in space of the difference between the kiramoto shibashinsky solution and the different uh, interpolants. So here you get the type one. So it is, they, you show, actually you get the same type. So, so the x-axis here is epsilon. So epsilon is going to zero uh, this way. And this is a log log plot. So we actually get uh, order one as, a, as, a, as predicted uh, and order two for the others. So it seems that those, those uh, um, those powers on the epsilon in the, in the theorem are, are actually uh, accurate, but uh, and, and we're hitting something close to machine precision uh, down here. So anyway, we're happy to see uh, those kinds of plots. Um, let's see, this is, oh, that's L, L infinity L2, this is L infinity L infinity. Uh, we don't actually have a proof of, for L infinity L, L infinity, but we checked it numerically and we get something which looks fairly similar. Uh, yeah, so, um, I guess future results or upcoming things. Uh, oh, sorry, a bit over time. Um, yeah, we're interested in uh, behavior of this thing as epsilon goes to zero past the blow of time. Do we have any ideas there? Not really, no, <laughs> right? We don't even know if KSE does blow up. Uh, lately with some numerical simulations, we've been thinking that maybe it does blow up. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, I mean, our guys, it's very hard to say, right? Because it's no problem. Um, but uh, we're, we're thinking about taking, you know, going past some kind of reported blow up time and seeing what happens. Uh, and then, you know, can we say anything about attractors or inertial manifolds? I don't know. I, uh, I'm for, uh, I've gone through periods where I think the answer is yes, and we can absolutely say something. And then it turns back to no, because the structure of the nonlinearity is actually uh, a little more challenging than in, in uh, one dimension. Um, and then these kind of calming ideas, we think we can extend this to 3D never Stokes. Actually, Matt's mostly done with this. It looks like there's no, no issues with uh, extending these calming ideas for 3D never Stokes. Your nonlinearity doesn't vanish, but you don't care because you have L infinity control. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. So, questions or comments? I asked a question about the last yeah. thing you said about attractors and inertia manifolds. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have the? I didn't see. Maybe I missed it. The uh, is the solution uniformly bounded in time? No. I mean, if, if we could show that, we'd be more or less done. I see. That's the, the whole so difficulty is show that. absorbing ball. So yeah. it may it may grow. The solution may grow, even the coming for the coming equation. You just have it's like. Yeah. I mean. 
it's finite for finite time and that's Get, getting back so so the way to get bound right even in one dimension the dimension at the beginning the showing the existence of global attractor is is pretty hard um and the way that they were able to do it in one dimension is by a use of this gauge function where you basically replace the solution with the solution plus some time independent uh function to be chosen later and then you are able to basically you get some estimates on the uh, nonlinear term combined with the fourth order derivative term uh, and get some kind of uh, nice lower bound on the on those those quantities. This argument of Nikolenko, Scher, and Tamam um, to kind of push everything uh, to you end up choosing that function to be like a, a highly oscillatory approximation of the identity, um, and then you can you can do it. Uh, how to do that in higher dimensions uh, is is much less obvious. Basically, because you have those mixed uh, th those terms in the off diagonal of the nonlinearity, so you have like a u one uh, times uh, you know y derivative or u one times x derivative of u two those those kinds of those two terms in the off off uh, derivative uh, off diagonal uh, pieces of the nonlinearity. Um, it's it's much less clear how to control those uh, with this going back through a gauge function technique, let alone with uh, the, the eta bound. Now, in simulations, it looks bounded. So, I mean, we have hope, but um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of actually showing uh, time independent bound analytically, I mean, we don't know how to do that right now. We've had some ideas and it feel, there's a few times where it felt like we we're close, but we're not there. Other questions, comments, Trevor? Um, uh, two really probably very naive questions. Um, uh, okay, so, so what exactly do you mean when you say that this uh, calming procedure basically works for Navier Stokes as well? I mean, it, oh, yeah, yeah. So you put a uh, similar thing on the nonlinearity for Navier Stokes. Yeah, sure. And uh, I mean, just everything looks like, yeah, I mean, you, you get, yeah, yeah, you, you basically beat the cubic nonlinearity and, and things are okay. You have a little more trouble because uh, derivatives are now an issue again in every Stokes. Uh, but because you have this kind of very strong control of the nonlinearity, I mean, it's kind of going back to like, it's like the delay is the same thing as yeah. if you do the delay approximation. Yeah, yeah. You need eta epsilon to, Keep you in the divergence-free world, and uh, but that's the thing. And then that's it. You kind of don't. I mean, so you don't have to. Keep, Ada doesn't have to maintain divergence-free anymore. I mean, so the the solution is divergence-free, but the nonlinearity doesn't vanish because you have the Ada term. But you don't care because it's L infinity. You have L infinity control. So right. I mean, but you, how do you get the L two conservation? You need the uh, conservation plus an infinity control to get uh, the bounds on the. No, L2, L2 comes fine because you take inner product with. Uh, How does it? I don't see it. You take inner product with uh, U and you get uh, the. So, how do you control the nonlinear term with the common solution in L2? You, you just put an L infinity norm on the eta term. The L infinity norm controls it immediately. And it, exactly like you get in. In KFC, it doesn't vanish, like in uh, like in every Stokes, but uh, you don't care because you have L infinity control. But you have a gradient of U. That's okay. You absorb that into the viscosity. You use. Uh, is this going against you? No, not in every Stokes. Oh, for an every Stokes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in every Stokes, you have the right sign. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we, we I mean, it's kind of preliminary sure. results. So, I'm not claiming that it's completely closed yet, but I think we're pretty close. So, uh, sure. So, um, are there any like uh, exact special solutions to Komodo distributions? In 1D, I think the answer is yes. Actually, yeah, there's, there's even some, there's a nice paper by, uh, at Reese and somebody uh, where they look, uh, they, they get uh, nice you know, steady states and things like that. I mean, of course, these are pretty unstable. Sure. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, in 1D, yes, in 2D, yes, if you basically make them, you just take a 1D solution, trivially make it 2D. But uh, I, I, I don't know that anybody's looked at it for, I mean, maybe George Sell or, or, or maybe you or if it's, I don't know, uh, would know, uh, well, of course, uh, maybe they looked at this kind of thing, I don't know. Igor might be here on Zoom. Oh, maybe he is. <laughs> we seem to have five people on Zoom. Oh. Well, we had five people on Zoom, so I don't know whether uh, Igor is one of them. It's not Igor. It's no. not Igor. But, uh, anyway. um, it's probably way past bedtime for Igor. Oh, right, right. He's in Germany yeah. again. Well, he's, he's on this talk uh, about a month ago. He didn't mention anything about that, but um, yeah, as far as I know, in 2D, uh, no. I mean, you know, non trivial 2D solutions. I, think. I don't know. If you, if you hear of any, let me know. I'd love to. What about for this uh, special system that you, that you hooked up? Well, I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that would be great, but yeah. I mean, it seems like since you're I mean, sort of controlling one direction, like you might be able to. Yeah, that, yeah, maybe something like one and a half dimensional. Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Could could maybe go. I have a naive question. Great. What if you replace u x x with u and uh, u x x x x? Yeah, with just two derivatives. You know what? Yeah, yeah. We like still I, have the same problem. Yeah, yeah. But with uh, and, no then, more. and then I think you want to probably. And then you can make it some if you want or something. And yeah. yeah. So so in this case, you probably want to switch some signs. That's right. Yeah. So this yeah. is uh, something that's called Berger Shimashinsky equation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a nice paper by Goodman where he looked at. So in the same paper where he proved for global attractor uh, for. When you can't see, he also looks at, at this equation proves the global attractor there. Uh, we also did that for this. Uh, we put a, uh, a U1 in this paper. So we, we didn't do it in the archive version, but then uh, I think uh, somewhere like either the editor uh, or the, the reviewer asked us to put it, or maybe we just put it just for good measure. But anyway, yeah, you can put a U1 here. And uh, so, so plus U1, so you have like a backward damping, and everything works. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of proving attractors, I have no idea because that disrupts in, everything. In 2D. In uh, 2D. In 1D, it's clear, but how about yeah. in 2D? Uh, wait, wait, uh, oh, I mean, you mean 2D, 2D KSE? 2D, 2D KSE with lambda U and Laplace. Yeah, I, there's, I mean, there shouldn't be any, any trouble in this case because you get uh, maximum principle for uh, U2, and then you can basically crank back the other way and everything's okay. So, yeah. So, any more questions or comments? Uh, let's thank Adam, Adam again, and I believe it's being recorded. Thank you.